Hey, welcome back to the study of the book of Mark. And as we go through the Gospels in the next several months, um, we get to glean off of what each of them kind of talked about, how they seen Jesus' ministry. And, you know, we, we had a little intro last week of Mark and and who he was, a little bit who he was, not really in-depth. The in-depth part is when you go back and you study and you know, we, 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 we just a you know kind of back cover. We talked about Jesus, talked about his you know his first disciples, and then <clears throat> we talked about being baptized in water and being baptized in the Holy Spirit and the difference the difference between John the Baptist and, and Jesus. And we know these these are um but it's it's neat that each, how Mark defines each one. And you know, the question was posed to you, why did Jesus get water baptized? Some say, you know, out of obedience, some would say maybe um, to, to it's, it's a time of the, to signify who he was. He came to to rescue all men because John the Baptist uh, was about repentance, and and Jesus didn't have to repent, but he was representing us in, in the midst of being 100% man, 100% God, as he came. And then we talked about how the temptations of Jesus. Remember how he the, the Holy Spirit drove him out into the wilderness, and we talked about you know how does Jesus know what we go through? He only, it only lists three temptations he had faced, but. You understand, he was tempted probably every day. And in, in our minds, it was just, we think, oh, he got tempted, you know, just one day. Well, no, he was out there for 40 days. And he had to go through everything that we would have gone through. You know, we, you could go back in your own mind and your own notes and think about um, the things that Jesus went through and the things we go through. Uh, we talked about even in Hebrews 4, it says, in, uh, for we not have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weakness, but the one... In every res respect has been tempted as we are, yet he was without sin. And, and, and you know, that's that's what it comes down to. Jesus was perfect. He was sinless. Uh, and he paved the way that we would have salvation. He made it happen. It was through him, his, his death, his burial, his resurrection. Um, as believers, we accept him as Lord and Savior. And we, we get to have eternal life with him. Not just in heaven, but also here on earth, we get to have fellowship with him. And that opened it toward the veil, and it opened up uh, communication with God. And <clears throat> this week, we're going to pick back up in chapter one. We're going to finish up chapter one, maybe grab a little chapter two. We'll see how far we get. Um, we're going to. I think we stopped last week at um, chapter verse twenty uh, after Jesus called his disciples, and there was like no hesitation. Those guys came, and the first thing you see, he gets. It says in verse 21 and verse 22 of chapter 1 of Mark, it says, And he went to Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribe. Now, it's interesting, though, when you really think about it and you study some of the things that were written, and I think it even happens today, even with pastors or or rabbis or scribes. Back then, rabbis and scribes, would they would get together together but they would quote other scribes and or rabbis. You know, a lot of times you see people on Facebook or social media, they quote something from like Oswald Chambers or um, Martin Luther or, or somebody they really like. Um, they quote, this is what this guy said. Well, here we see that Jesus, when Jesus came, he, he spoke of what the Word of God said and directly what the Father said. You know, he, never, he, never, he never quoted any authors. He never quoted that an, an, an aspect that we see here. And, and you know, all the times we think of, you know, this guy said this, this guy said this, and I'm not, I'm not picking on the people who do that, and I'm not picking on the people who they're quoting. But why is it we got to quote somebody else's thoughts instead of quoting what Jesus said in the Word of God? You know, whether you know, if you think about this, our, we need to be quoting the scriptures and not what other people say. I mean, some other people say things with great wisdom, but it's man's wisdom. What does the Holy Spirit say? And we. As body believers, we need to be following what Jesus did and quote the Word of God. Because you're saying what the Father said. And when you think about this, though, is Jesus quoted the truth, but Jesus was the truth. And can, I mean, this might be a little different for you, but is truth a person? Think about this. And I'm not going into anything strange or weird, you know what I mean. But it says, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That was in John 14, 6. See, we can say, I know the truth because I read the Bible. Um, but what gets us into trouble, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of times opinions 
of what the Bible said. Think of all the different denominations that are out there. Man's different opinions. Jesus was the only one who could say that he was the truth. Let his words speak the truth and authority. Anywhere Jesus spoke, when he spoke, boom, it happened. There was an authority. There was, there was backing behind it. See, we can get lost in our opinions, but what is the truth? And anytime we have a lot of conversations, you know, even growing into ministry, there was a, a minister who would always say, you know, we'd start talking about something. Maybe, you know, I was kind of fishing for an opinion, just to be honest. And he says, what's the word of God say to you, Mark? And he would always bring me back to the word of God. Because he goes, my opinion and your opinion doesn't matter. What does the word of God say? Now, if we're talking about ice cream, my opinion, I like cookies and cream. I like uh, uh, chocolate marshmallow. I like red velvet cake. But when it comes to when it comes to the word of God and truth, we need to quote what the scripture says. Amen. Verse 23 says, Immediately there was a there was in their synagogue a man who was unclean spirit, and he cried out. Now we can either be Interesting, we think about this, an unclean spirit. We understand what it means to be unclean from the Old Testament perspective. It says, well, here he's talking about a man with an unclean spirit. We would say a demon. Uh, we either are indwelt, we can either be indwelt by or hosted by a demon. Or as believers, I don't want to say we're possessed, but the Holy Spirit is living inside of us. Uh, when we have the Holy Spirit, he brings freedom. He he brings hope. He brings encouragement. The demonic brings slavery. Um, Holy Spirit gives us a choice to listen to him. A demon would control you. Uh, the Holy Spirit says, hey, hey, Mark, listen, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. I have an option to listen to him. That's my option. It's free will. It's what God gives to us. Whereas if I'm possessed by a demon, um, he more or less controls me and what he wants to do, not what, what glorifies God. But the fundamental idea is, is kind of similar in, in, to the indwelling. But when we're believers, um, we're, we're indwelt by the Holy Spirit, who we welcome in. But though, how does one become indwelled or possessed by a demon? Normally, from the studies I've seen, it's more of an invitation. Right now, remember, I invited the Holy Spirit in me. Now, there's people out there that, that it's true. There's people out there who, who invite uh, demonic, demonic things in their lives. Um, we can't open many different cultic doors. You know, you know, I think as a kid growing up, you know, my neighborhood kids and friends, used to, the, there was a big, big, great thing on TV, uh, Ouija boards. And it's just a game, it's a kid thing. Actually, it's not. It's actually, it leads and opens up to doors in people's lives into, into the, spiritual, the dark spiritual realm. Uh, Excuse me, we can open ourselves to idolatry and its practices. People all around the world do this. Uh, and it's, it's, it's sad, but it does happen. So when I was talking about being dwelled, we're indwelled by the Holy Spirit as believers. But there are people who are indwelled by uh, the demons. False, fall, uh, fallen angels, demons, uh, evil spirits, you know, however you want to do it. And a question that always comes to me once in a while, it says, can a born-again Christian be possessed by a demon? Absolutely not. They cannot. Um, there's really no examples in scriptures to ever see a Christian who is demonically uh, possessed. Because can you imagine the Holy Spirit hanging out with, a, with an evil spirit? Ain't going to happen. He kicks them out. Jesus kicks them out. Um, yes, we're going to have spiritual warfare and we have battles. Yes. But I don't believe a, 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 a born again, a bona fide, true uh, born again believer filled with the Holy Spirit would even want to be possessed, um, but can cannot be possessed by a, a demon. Uh, but there are some out there. Listen, there are some out there that say uh, believers can be possessed by a demon. I am not one of them. So um, you 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 can make your own deter determination on that. But it says First John. 1 John 5, 18 says, We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who is born of God protects, God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. 
It's more like this. It's a hands-off approach for the enemy to understand. It's us and, and, and Jesus. But listen, the enemy is always on the prowl. And that's something we need, to, we need to concern ourselves with. Be sober-minded, it says in 1 Peter 5. 8 and 9 says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your advers adversary, the devil, prowls are like a roaring lion seeking um, someone to devour. Resist him firm in your faith, knowing that the some kind, same kind of sufferings are to be experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, God of all grace, who has called you the eternal glory of Christ to himself, restore, confirm, strengthen, establish you. To him be dominion forever and ever. And amen. Do we get real attacks from the enemy? Yes. But for me, a born-again believer cannot be uh, demonically possessed. Now, can they come up and oppress you? Kind of like, you know, climb on your shoulders? Can they, in a sense, like bother you, speak in your ear? Yeah, they do. But you got the Holy Spirit inside, you don't have to worry about it. Ephesians 6, 12 says this, We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. So there's plenty of scriptures about spiritual battle, spiritual warfare, but not about Christians being possessed by a demon. So verse 24 says, what do you have to do with us? Now listen, Jesus and Nazareth, the demons already know who he is. They don't, they're not clueless. They know the word of God. Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, holy one of God. They know who they are. They, they're fearful of him. They know, they know who he is. Um, demons would speak through their host to expose who he was, and that's, you know, of why Jesus came. Hey, we know who you are. Remember the, the one in, where he tossed them in all the pigs? Pigs went over the hillside. Uh, Romans occupied the Holy Land for many years, dominated and conquered, and the Jews were hated by the Roman leadership. Uh, at least in 30 years of Jesus' life, there was an anticipation of deliverer uh, when they came, or when they began to see the miracles happening, they wanted him to do it. God had uh, had set a timetable for things to happen. Um, why I said that is this, is that um, when the demons would announce who Jesus was, it was not the right timing. God has a certain timing for this, and that's why Jesus would, would kind of shut them up, be quiet. Uh, he didn't want people to know who he really was. Um, he wanted them, for me, my, my opinion would be he wanted them to search their hearts. Do you, do you know who I am? But he did not, there was only, a, like I mentioned earlier, um, there was an anticipation, remember now, in the Old Testament there was prophecies, uh, there was anticipation of when Jesus, was, or the, the Messiah would come, um, but there was a certain timing that God wanted to, to when he kind of like came out and said, this is who I am, and he did throughout the scriptures, but you'd have to be looking for it. But they were anticipating this to happen, and they didn't want the Romans to uh, to be oppressors. Uh, they wanted Roman out of out of the, out of out of Israel altogether. Um, so when Jesus started doing all these different miracles, who's this guy? Who's this man? Even the leader said this or that. Um, even the demons would come in and say, "Hey, this is who he is," and they would, that's when Jesus would say, "Hey, look, shut up, get out of them." Because it says in verse twenty five and twenty six, it says, "But Jesus rebuked them, saying, Be silent." And come out of him. Complete authority. Um, he didn't go up and do any things you see with people on TV do. He walked up. Be silent. Come out of him. Because it was not his timing yet. And it said the unclean spirit convulsing him. Crying out with a loud voice. Came out of him. You see the authority of Jesus. Jesus was not. But it was interesting though is this. You know. Jesus was not the only person going around doing this. Um. Others tried, but they were not successful. But but they kept trying. Uh, like I mentioned a little bit, like on TV, there was a time I seen a guy who would to a, a person that was possessed by a, a demon or supposed to be possessed by a demon or a spirit, and he was he would hit him in the stomach with a with a cross, a metal, a big like a big metal cross. And you know I can't see Jesus doing that. Sorry, um, it's a word that says he goes up and he spoke with authority. Uh, we're not supposed to sit there and hang out, have a conversation, have some coffee with someone that's possessed with a demon. Uh, Jesus didn't. He shows the example. You know, as born again believers, if leading by the Holy Spirit, you go. Someone's possessed. You, you can. Um, God can use you to cast out. He doesn't need you, but we can go up. We lay hands on people and say, "Lord Jesus, we ask that you remove this foul spirit from 
this person's life, and this person has to be willing to say, yeah, get, 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 get rid of this. I don't want this demon in me. Um, but you see the authority in Jesus, and, and you know, other people would lose, maybe use some fancy languages, maybe they throw some holy water on them, do some kind of ceremonies, uh, and they would probably use a lot of long-worded things, kind of these, make up these prayers. But it's interesting that we watch, you know, whether you see it on TV or some of these people in, in different churches, and I'm not knocking them, hey, look, everybody has to, um, you know, if, but you can see who's false and who's, who's real. I mean, Jesus walks up to the demon, the demon gets out immediately. Uh, the demon leaves, and the, and the people were amazed how fast Jesus could do it. Because you got to remember, um, the Jews would do it, or the other life, please, and it'd take long after long after long. It, may, it might be two, three hours. You know, it's all these long-winded prayers, and nothing ever happened. Jesus walks up, leave, shut up, get out. You're done. Go on. You know, and it should tell you about God's authority. Who is this man? This guy is unbelievable. But it says in verse 27 and 28, it says, They were amazed, so they questioned among themselves, Who is this? Or what is this? A new teaching and with authority, he commanded even unclean spirits, and they obey him. I mean, can you imagine being there like, boom, there he is, there they go. And once his fame spread everywhere throughout the surrounding region of Galilee, not because of how he dressed, not because of all the, 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 the jets he had or all the, the big mansion he had. It's because who he was and the authority he carried of being God on earth. And it's interesting that, you know, so many times people just kind of exploit others. And it's just, it says, so be careful. Just be careful um, what you watch, what you listen to, what you hear. Uh, but know that even this, even when we start this out, I don't believe uh, Christians can be uh, possessed by a, a, an evil spirit. Born again. True true born again believers, I should say. Not Christians, because the word Christian has been hijacked too. But a, a true born again believer, I don't believe, cannot be uh, demonically uh, possessed. <clears throat> then he left, he jumped on to verse 29 to 31. It says, uh, Jesus heals many. It says, immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon uh, and Andrew and, with James and John. And now Simon's mother-in-law laid ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. You ever have a fever? Nasty things. And he came and, and he took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve him. You know, when we look at this, it's just a simple miracle. You know, with him, it's just like lifestyle. Us, we look at this, whoa, you know, how do we break fevers? You know, take, if you're really high on, you know, your temperature's really high, you know, in the old days, we used to take ice baths. Then you get chills, then you might get worse, but it breaks the fever. Sometimes you have a fever, you, 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 you know, people would put tons of clothes on and go to bed. You know, sometimes we just, just simply just take some medicine. You know, think about, think about when we have a fever nowadays, we need at least three days to recoup to get our strength back. And it says here, she gets up and immediately to serve. I mean, that, that's amazing. That's just a, a, we look at it as a miracle, as a simple miracle, you know, and it's interesting though, but whatever, you know, it's interesting that she had that immediate healing because whatever we lost, God gave back and she went to serve him. Because it goes on and says that evening at sundown, they brought him all who were sick or oppressed by demons. Busy day for Jesus, you know. He's going through the times. He's starting to heal people. People are seeing this. People are seeing that. There's an excitement. There's a buzz in the air. There's something different than the same old, same old religious garbage they've heard for years. You know, and some of the people probably thinking who, who studied the Old Testament and said, hey, wait a minute. The Old Testament, you said prophecies of the coming Messiah. Maybe this is who it, this is. Because is. it said the whole city, in verse 33, it says the whole city was gathered together at the door. Could you imagine that? Jesus is walking through time. People are getting healed. Miracles are happening. They hear about Peter's mom. She's feeding them after the, the, the fever left her. She was, I mean, there was nothing wrong with her. The fever was broke. She was back to normal. She had full strength. God restored her strength after the, the effect of the sickness here. Um, doesn't say what kind of fever, just a fever. And um, it was it. She's because you know what? God, you, you, 
you healed me. You made, you, you made it well with me. You gave me my strength. You gave me, you helped me. Now I'm going to serve you because you're worthy of all glory and praise. And when God does something interesting or a miracle in your life, what do you do afterwards really does matter. Do we bring honor and glory to him? Do we serve him? Do we do things for him? And it says, the whole city was gathered at the door and he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. Uh, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. You know, remember, it's because of God's timing. You needed, God has a purpose and a timing. We do it the way God wants to do it. But it's interesting that Jesus really never turned anyone away. Imagine, just imagine how tired he was. Day and day out, day and day out. But I think it was a, a good tired in a sense because... He was seeing the effects of what sin had did on, the, on God's creation, and, and he was making it right. He was making it right, and there was plans to make things right. And we'll see a new heaven and a new earth. We'll, we'll see it all at, at the end time when he says it's time. Boom. But we see continual compassion for people. Jesus had always had compassion for people. He didn't matter what, what, where you came, what color you were, what, how much money you made, what your prominence was. It didn't matter to him. It didn't matter. All lives matter to God. And this is where we need to be. And the demons even knew Jesus. James 2.19 says this, If you believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. You believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe and shudder. I read two different translations here. One from the ESV and one from the NIV. I like, I like, I like how the NIV did, does this. Now, I'm not a great fan of the NIV, but if you read it, that's good. Um, it's how you, you know, what translation do you enjoy the most? And this one says, do you believe that there is one God? It's almost like, good. It, it's good that you believe. It's it's good. Whereas the ESV says, you do well. But I like how it just says, boom, good. And he says, even the demons uh, believe. And they and they shudder. I think a lot of people rest in the, in, in the same knowledge to know Christ but not knowing Christ. It's those who receive him as Lord and Savior. So you go up to somebody, you know God? Yeah, I know God. You know Jesus? Yeah, I know Jesus. Guy, you know, died on a cross for people. I know him. But they don't really know him inside. It's not that they know Jesus. Yeah, he's a cool guy. Jesus is a cool guy. I mean, he was a really nice guy. But they don't know him as Lord and Savior, and that's, that's where we need to be. And there's a lot of people who think they're going to heaven, who we think will be going to heaven and actually won't be, and people that we don't think go to heaven will go to heaven because they had that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, when it comes down to the point, He is my Savior, He is my Lord, and it comes from the heart. It's heart. First uh, John 1, 12 says, But to all who did receive Him, who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. That's us. You know? If, if you give your heart to Christ, you're one of His. Amen? Let's go to verse 35. should be Jesus preaches in Galilee. Verse 35 says, And arising early in the morning, while it was still dark, He departed and went out to a desolate place, and there He prayed. It should amaze us that Jesus prays. He shows so many examples in the Scriptures where uh, whether you, whatever your job is, whatever you do, it doesn't matter. This is not just for pastors. Or elders or church leaders. This is for everybody that we need to take some time, some set time set apart. My my greatest times with God is when I can just go driving, because normally if I'm sitting down somewhere, someone's looking for me. This way, I take my phone, I put it on mute, throw it in the back seat, get in my car, and I drive. Don't put the radio on, and it's okay, God. Here I am. I have some great times that God. Um. Speaks to my heart and speaks to me about me. And we just had that one-on-one -on -one thing. And it's it's interesting. So seriously, when Jesus says he goes to a desert place, Jesus goes to the mountain, um, find a place where you can go where no one can bother you and spend some time with him. And in verse 36, it goes on and says, And Simon, those who uh, with him searched for him, and they find him and said, Everyone is looking for you. Can you imagine that? I think everybody would look for him. You know? And it said to him, let us go down to the next town that I may preach there also. For that's why I came out. A long, a long day of ministry. Jesus probably goes into the night, finds a place to rest, 
before the sun rises up, he's he's praying, he's seeking the Lord. And in the morning, we see him, Lord, here I am, what's next? But you know, when you read the scriptures and you see Jesus' life, he, he he teaches us how to do it the way he did it. And it shows that he cared a lot about people and he cared a lot about praying. Prayer should not be a convenient thing. We we need to know that we wrestle against uh, the flesh. We wrestle against the spiritual things. We need to be in a place where we sacrifice and pray, that we purpose to pray. It's not everybody. See, it's it's sad that a lot of today's believers, a lot of today's Christians, um, so Christian real ones, um, that they just it's like prayer is like a third or fourth thought. Prayer needs to be something that's done every day. It needs to be sacrificial prayer. It needs to be a place where, Lord, here I am. Father, how can we make how can we you know, make things right? How do we how do we change the atmosphere in the church? How do we change the atmosphere in my life? How do I change the way that our communities are? And you begin to pray. You begin to pray. You begin to talk and ask, ask, and build a relationship with Him. And third, verse thirty nine says, and He went throughout all of Galilee, preaching in the synagogues and casting out demons. So once again, you see Him fighting against the demons, He's casting them out. It doesn't say He put a big show on. It didn't say He did. Uh, an hour and a half of uh, worship um, of I mean when I say worship I mean songs and dance and he didn't need that he went and he prayed he sought the father out he didn't have any kind of long prayers he just went up and did it last part of this I believe is about uh, the, the about the leper I want to cover a lot about the leprosy um <clears throat> It says in verse 40, it says, And a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling said to him, If you will, can you make me clean? Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him. And he said to him, I will be clean. It was pretty cool. Plain words, simple. Not a long, very long process. Immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. It's just like, again, it seems like Jesus shows some great compassion to people. See, God wished that none would perish. Now, 2 Peter 3 9, it says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but his patience towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Hmm. You know, I'm not going to even get into that on that uh, rabbit trail, but he wants all people to repent. Remember, it goes back to free choice, right? Free will. God is willing that all men be saved. So I gave you a couple of another scripture, First Timothy, I think it is. Second, wait, First Timothy 2, verse 4 through 7 says, Who desires all people to be saved to come to the knowledge of truth? For there is one God, one mediator between God and man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself up for ransom for all, which is a testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher, Paul. Paul's preaching to, to the Timothy, an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying. Which is interesting, he has to say that. Uh, a teacher of the Gentile in faith and truth. But think about, let's go back, let's go back to, to the leper for a minute. Just think about the man's request. It was like a prayer. Think about it. Can you see him? Please, please, can you heal me? Can you can you make me clean? He, he knew who this guy was. Because, you know, I think, I think was this one of the guys of the ten? It, 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 it doesn't, and this, and this gospel doesn't say that, but think about this. Will you heal me? Can you? Will you? But it says, I guess, if you will. If you will. Well, think about that. If you will, you can make me clean. A lot of power just in those little words. I like when Jesus says, move with pity. In this channel, move with pity. He stretched out his hand and touched him and said, I, I will. I will. I have the authority. Happy yeah, clean. Immediately leprosy wrote, uh, left him. He was made clean. Um, but think how many times when we pray, we try to use fancy words or say things that maybe look us more spiritual. Prayer is just talking to God. God, I need you is a simple prayer. And everybody's like, well, what do you need him to do? God knows. You don't have to break down and for four and a half hours, but there are times that God will call you to fast for something or someone for four and a half hours, but prayer is this conversation. 
with God. There's times that, yes, we need to intercede. There's times that we're just going to, you know, still use the fancy words. He just, you're mediate, you're standing before God saying, I need this to happen and just pray. But let's look at the man's prayer for a minute. It was a sincere prayer. Sincere prayers come from the heart. He, this man is imploring him. I need healed. It was a reverent prayer because if you go back to the verse, it says in, it says in verse 40, it says this, a leper came to him imploring him, okay? begging him, basically, to me, kneeling him. There's a repentance. There's, a, there's an honoring. There is a, an, uh, there's a, a reverence that he's showing to Jesus. He said, listen, here I am. There was also a, a humbling, and there was also a submissive part of that. If you will. You, you see how this man's prayer was? It was a believing prayer. You can. It was acknowledging his need. Listen, listen, dude. Jesus, I got a lot of problems. This leprosy's taking me out. Make me clean. Can you heal me? Will you heal me? Make me clean. It was specific. He didn't just give him a Paul Park shotgun kind of effect of prayers. He said, listen, I'm specific. I got leprosy. I need I need clean. I need made well. I need to be made whole. It was personal because he was coming for himself. Listen, God, here, I'm suffering. And a lot of times there's people out there that are suffering. Tell Jesus, hey, listen, Jesus, I need healed. You know, maybe you have migraines. Maybe you have uh, stomach ache. Maybe a muscle ache. Whatever it may be. You know, take take a page out of this guy's book and say, and, and, and begin to pray like this guy. He's imploring him, kneeling at him, giving him being reverence. He's being humble. He's being submissive. He was believing. He was acknowledging that, hey, there's a problem in my life. He was being specific. He was being personal. It was just a brief, brief several just words in the Greek. It was That was it. God doesn't need flowery words. But just to talk to him, we need... Not the, uh, um, we don't need to have the fancy words to elevate prayers because of the person praying them. Your prayer is just as important to God as, I know this, your prayers are just as important to God as some way we would consider like some, some great, you know, faith ministry, healing ministry. Like, you know, you see, uh, like Charles or Andy Stanley or Benny Hinn or Franklin or, or the late Billy Graham. You know, whenever you pray and your heart's humbled and you're reverent and you're submissive to God, your prayers are being heard. You don't have to have five layer jets. You don't have to have a big mansion. You don't have to have all kind of money. God hears you. Jesus had none of that stuff. And the Father heard him because of his heart. Jesus' heart was the Father's will. Plain and simple. Boom. Have you ever gone out, you know, have you ever gone out to... An event where someone who was a ministry like I don't know I'm just make I'm not saying I've gone to these places places like uh, Joyce Myers or Stephen Furtick or Rob Parsley or you know where people stand in line just to have those people pray over them because we've elevated them to a place of um, superior faith or superior prayers and how they spoke how eloquent they were. You know, and we all you, you stood in line, or we stood in line, and had expectations from their prayers. We kind of treated them kind of like. Do you ever see the show? Now, listen, I didn't more. I didn't watch this, but I do. I know it's out there, American Idol kind of approach. We set these people up like God listens to them before more than He listens to anybody. Not true. You know, see them in the context of the Bible. It's dangerous to elevate or think others' prayers are better than yours or mine. When we pray from the heart, when we pray with it with a genuine humility before God, He hears our prayer. You want a great genuine prayers? Get a kid. You know, there was a time when when I was a children's pastor, we used to have we had permission once in a while, not all the time, because we saw that stigma with kids and people don't think kids have faith. It was just weird. But in time, anyways, we had the kids would come up. Like we'd probably pick um Probably, I want to say like third grade and up. People that were before, maybe second grade and up, depending on the child, uh, how they understood what they were praying and, and stuff like that. But listen to it. If you're sick and you don't feel good, go grab a kid. 
go grab a kid who's a believer in Christ and say, hey, can you pray over me? You know, and you can see their childlike faith. They're not weird. They're not trying to impress you with words. You know, there might be a kid laying hands on you one time, picking their nose with the other hand, praying at the same times, but the words would be honest and genuine to see you made whole. As believers, our access is the throne is the same. God wants prayers from the heart, not to sign super spiritual. James 5, 16 says, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Your prayers are powerful in its effects. Leprosy was tough, though, in biblical times. You can read this. If you go to Leviticus, I think it's 13 and 14, or chapters 13 and 14. You know, and it was interesting because some of the, the, the what was set down from, from the, the, in Leviticus is if someone is, who was a leper, you would think two things. A walking dead person only a matter of time before they drop over because leprosy was very fatal. Now, I, it's, I think leprosy still is, a, is today, but I think we have so many different medications that... Um, but you can't heal them. I think you can control it, or, but you can't heal it. Not sure I'm not a doctor. Um, but another thing, when you've seen a person who's leprosy, uh, you're under some kind of judgment from God, and you're basically getting what you deserve. That's pretty sad, though, huh? But it was considered a sin. Now, painful it was, it seemed, though, how lepers were viewed in those days. Healthy Jews were taught, listen, from an early age, stay away from lepers at least six foot. <laughs> Social distancing, right? They were social distancing in the scriptures. They six foot away and, and never greet a leper in the, pub, in the public eye. When lepers came around others, they would have to yell, I'm unclean, I'm unclean, I'm unclean. And people would, would avoid them. There would be some serious social distancing. And they didn't wear masks. Um, Jesus did the unthinkable though. He touched with compassion and made him whole. But it shows the true heart of God. God wants to redeem, wants people to be made whole. Because it says in verse 43 and 44, it says, And Jesus sternly charged him sin and sent him away at once. And he said to them, See that nothing to... Wait, sorry. He says to them, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer your cleansing that Moses commanded for proof to them. They had, they had, they, they had to show them that they were healed. And, and Jesus tells them, in keeping with the law of Moses, go get checked out, show yourself to be clean. They could tell the priest, a miracle has taken place. But when, verse 45 says, but he went out and began to talk freely about it and spread the news. So once again, you know, we, we, we see that, did he listen? No, but so Jesus could no longer openly enter a town. Remember, it's a timing thing. Everything was with timing with God. Yes, God knew what was going on. But was out in desolate places, and people were coming to him from every quarter. People are still seeking out Jesus and really fearfully and discouraged about the condition of our country. You know, we, we do. We need to be seeking Jesus about our country. Let me ask you a question. You know, think about there's people out there saying, God, come back, come back, come back, come back, come back. You know, I, I would like to see him come back. I think it would be pretty neat to see what happens. Um, but, you know, they, they look at our country and they look. And they said, look, I vote for hopeless or I vote for more hopelessness. These are my two choices. You know, I get this character here or I get this character here and they're all going to do what they want to do anyways. But the problem with that is, is that we, we should not allow being fearful or being discouraged. We shouldn't. Matthew 5, one of my favorite verses is 5.14, but I'm going to go from Matthew 5, 13 through 16. It says, You are the salt of the earth. But if salt lost its taste, how, how shall its saltness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out, trampled on people's feet. It says this in verse 14, You are the light of the world, a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, on a stand, and give its light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to Father in heaven. Think about this. We are the ones that Christ has brought into this place to bring um, 
love and light, God's light into a dark world. We're to guide people to Christ. And we cannot allow our emotions to be buried under, you know, and, and to be buried under negative pessimism of what is being broadcasted among the news. And even in our cultures, that, you know, when, what happens is when we start listening to what the news says, we become discouraged. And, you know, and we can't do that. People need to still hear the gospel from you. They need to see it in your life, not just from your lips. People want to see genuineness. People cannot pull back this day. This is our day. We need to lead many to Jesus. We need to be in a place where we are taking them from the darkness and the moral depravity to Jesus Christ and redemption, power, and authority. We have the answer. 1 Peter 3.15 says this, and I'll end with this. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Always be prepared to make defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet, do it with gentleness and respect. Meaning, when you want to talk to somebody about Jesus... Do it so a place you do not offend them. Well, the gospel offends people. Sure. How you speak to somebody is how they receive it. If you're going to sit there and yell at somebody and tell them they're going to hell, it's a truth, but it's not the white ray. Let's just be honest. Say, listen, hey, look, here, here's what it is. You tell me, explain. But the way the way people receive the church either brings them in or pulls them away. Yes, the Holy Spirit's going to be with you. Listen to what the Holy Spirit says. The Holy Spirit, if you're listening, will will give you the words to say to somebody, whether it's a drug addict or somebody's angry, or somebody that's lost in the world, just doing their own thing. But God has given us the opportunities to be that light, the salt, and we need to shine our light out. Amen? That wraps up chapter 1 of Mark. I'm not going to jump into chapter 2, but I do ask that you do read ahead, study ahead, and, and hear what you say. Like I said, any translation you want to use is fine. Uh, I like the ESV, and I like the NLT, uh, but it's up to you. Uh, let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word, and I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your strength, your mercy. And Father, I continually ask that, Lord, as we go through the book of Mark, that, Lord, your spirit would reveal more and more of your word, and that, Lord, we would be drawn more and more to you and who you are. I thank you for an advance, Father, for what you're doing. I ask you to be with everyone who is listening even tonight. Lord, that you would strengthen them and encourage them. In Jesus' name, we pray, amen. Be blessed, and Lord willing, we'll see you next week. Bye now.